I haven't ever had a, a tour of Normandy. I had a tour of the Dairy Queen uh, down the street. Gus, Gus, the retired uh, custodian, led it for me here. He knew the ins and outs. He was working there part-time. Uh, the Brazier Burger, Bill. Try one of those after hours. They're pretty darn tasty. I'm not going to walk down this path, Rob. <laughs> it's, uh, it's, uh, I might, uh, I might some way be interpreted as, uh, as throwing, uh, uh, taking some respect away from Normandy, and I don't want to do that. I either. understand that, sir. <laughs> okay. But get the Brazier Burger. I will. That soft serve ice cream, vanilla, very tasty. In studio, Steve Pearson. He is the uh, editor of the Independent Observer, and he'll be joining us at the campaign. Uh, style form that we'll be doing next uh, Tuesday at the Berkeley County Commission meeting room. Steve, good morning to you, sir. Yeah, I guess that means it's election season, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Starting to heat up. Yeah. yeah. And I guess November five is election day. Early voting uh, starts, I think, October nineteenth. Yeah. This year, right? Soon. So uh, we just had in studio Kara Keys, and we, I believe, at this point, talked to all the Jefferson County Commission candidates uh, who are running this year. The topic of solar comes up with each of those folks. Steve, tell me how important of an issue this is in Jefferson County, and is this uh, a single issue that could sway races? Well, you know, the sun will come up tomorrow, so I guess that's why there's an interest in solar, um, you know, because it's a ostensibly a free power source. Um, but it seems to come with a lot of costs in the localities, like a lot of things do. I mean, you know, there's it's, you know, whether it's, manufacturing, mining, you know, there's always uh, things that, you know, secondary things you got to deal with. In the case of uh, Jefferson County, and this is an issue that a lot of rural communities are dealing with, um, you know, you take a typical gas-fired plant, coal plant, nuclear plant, you know, it's a couple of acres, it, it sits there. Mm -hmm. uh, in order to generate electricity from the sun, you got to spread it out. So, uh, there's, there's, so far, there's one uh, solar facility uh, that's been constructed, and it sits on about 500 acres. And it's the smallest one that's planned for Jefferson County. So there's, there's four more, ranging from a little over 500 up to about 800 acres. So, you know, if you, if you, if you do the math, it, it ends up being about 3,000 acres. And that 3,000 acres, they'll, they're it's generating about, and this is where we're going to get to the math here, um, 80 say uh, megawatts of of energy you know so that's uh what 400 megawatts of energy total which is smaller than the average coal plant so you've taken you know to, to replicate the power that you would generate from a you know a fossil fuel plant you, you've got to spread it out you know so 3,000 acres so it, it's it's passive but it takes up a lot of farmland and uh, unfortunately, the first um, facility that went in uh, uh, did not take as the, the, the care it, it should have taken uh, with the, uh, the grading and, and the stormwater runoff. It's had numerous violations from the DEP. And so it set a, a, a bad taste in the mouth of the citizens that is this is what solar is going to look like. It's, you know, it's, it's poorly screened. It's right up against houses, right up against the road. It's the first thing you see. When you're coming in, uh, you know, old Charlestown Road, you know, off the mountain into Charlestown, you know, you're coming out here for a nice, uh, you know, weekend, you know, watching the foliage and you see this, you know, bare earth, black panels. Um, so that's what really, you know, people are, are concerned about that. Um, and it is, it, it's kind of cross in the crosshairs of that, where Jefferson County is going to be in the next 10, 20, 30 years. You know, the, the, a lot of farmers are saying, it's time. I mean, you know, we went through this, you know, 30, 40 years ago with the dairy farming. You know, there's not, there's, not, there's one dairy farm left in, in, in the county. What were those uh, tracts of land used to grow before, Steve? Do you know? Uh, corn, uh, soy, uh, uh, grazing depends on, on, on the Which, land. And mm -hmm. the, some of them were slated for housing development as well. So the portion of the, of the Blake project, at least, um, I want to say about 200 acres of that was scheduled to be housing. So that's another question. You know, do you want new houses or do you want solar panels it's not necessarily a question of does it stay pristine farmland and you know one a lot of people would question what is pristine farmland because farm farming is a business mm -hmm. you know it's not like some garden of eden it's it's a you know farms are working places so sure. um so solar is it's been an issue for the last year but and a lot of the candidates have taken this as like their you know their war cry um 
I don't think it differentiates between any of the candidates because the, none of them are really saying they're for solar. The issue, though, is that, as I said, there's five that have already been approved, um, and they've already been granted the rights to develop. And you can't stop those can't barring st a lawsuit. You, no, no and, and that would be you know taking away someone's property rights, and that's not you know looked upon very favorably here in, in West Virginia. So there's really nothing um, any of these candidates are going to be able to do to stop any of those five existing uh, solar facilities. And last time I looked, that's it. There are no other facilities you know, in the pipeline. So the only thing that might uh, be affected by any future you know, zoning changes, uh, there's one of them that's, that, asked, that came in and said, well, you know, we're such a good deal, we need a tax break. On our, on our equipment. We don't want to pay the full tax rate. We're, we're offering you, I think it was like yeah, about 25% of 28% of the taxes they want to pay. And the county commission said, well, we're, we're not interested in that because they turned around, they looked at all the citizens and thought, well, you know, there'd be a lot of pitchforks and torches if they gave uh, these mm -hmm. guys a tax break. So they said, well, we can't do the project. And they haven't formally said that they're not doing it, but you know, they said they weren't going to do it. There's no indication that they are moving forward. So that land is still there, still usable uh, for farming, but it's still available for another solar project. So it, you, you could see something, and these take two to three years to get through the permitting process just to connect into the grid before you go to the local authorities to ask for permission to build it. So some changes to the zoning laws might affect whatever happens on that property in the future. Uh, if that if that company decides to give it up, you know now again once you once you've got something permitted, they may not build it, but they may sell it to some other company. So you know you never know what's going to happen with these things. Bill, so, yeah, yeah. Uh, good morning, Steve. Uh, going to the county commission race uh, in Jefferson County, uh, there are five commissioners, four seats up available this time. There are I think nine people running for those. Uh, those four seats there's in one one district there are three folks running yeah. the other two districts uh which means you're gonna need a lot of chairs for your forum there yeah. uh the uh uh i'm having some difficulty not being in jefferson county makes it even more difficult to get some distinction differential a differential between these various candidates are you seeing the same thing and before you answer steve yeah. let me identify the candidates too in their districts the three uh, candidate district is Charlestown, where you have James Welch, a Democrat, David C. Tabb from the Mountain Party, and Jack Hefeste, the Republican. In the middle way, it's Natalie Grantham Friend and Michael Mood. Uh, Harper's Ferry is Lene Johnson and uh, Pasha Majdi. And then we just spoke earlier out of the Shepherdstown district with Kara Keyes, whose opponent is the Democrat, uh, Carrie Blessing. And important to, to make sure you distinguish between those two names, Kara and Carrie by the way good yes Steve. um no no there is there is a, a you know a lot of difference and and just you know just so that everyone knows this is not typical you know we would not normally have four That's seats right, open yeah. on the ballot mm -hmm. we'd normally just have one the middle way seat which is currently jane tab is uh sitting in that seat and she's retiring after three terms on the uh on the commission um so the two seats the, the middle way seat which is Grantham and, and Mood. And then the Charlestown seat is a vacancy that's been known for a while, uh, and that is you know, the three-way uh, race. Was that the Jane, uh, the, uh, the um, Claire? Claire Ath, Claire Ath right, yeah. who resigned uh, you know, shortly after she was reelected. Yeah. Um, and then the last two, the Shepherdstown uh, district seat and the Harpers Ferry seat, that's all tied into the, uh, the two commissioners that were removed. And that didn't get finalized until, um, well, the, the ruling was in May 1, but then it was appealed, and the appeal wasn't resolved by the uh, Supreme Court until uh, early August. So those uh, four candidates, you know, the two running in each of those districts, really didn't even know they were running until you know, a month before Labor Day. Um, so that's part of the challenge why I, I think you don't really, because they weren't running. You know, they were not out there. Uh, and none of the uh, Democratic candidates had, had um, primaries. So there wasn't, hasn't really been a lot of uh, electioneering going on until you know, very recently. So it, it's all it's like mushrooms after a, a rainstorm. All of a sudden, the, these signs popped up 
everywhere. And I think that's part of the confusion with, with you know, who's running against whom. So the, the way the Jefferson County Commission works, just like it does with Berkeley, you, you have these districts. Um, that's just really where these candidates have to reside. Um, so it's not like if you're in Shepherdstown, you're only voting for the Shepherdstown candidate, or if you're in Harpers Ferry, you're only voting in the Harpers Ferry race. Every citizen who's voting in Jefferson County gets to vote for four, all four commission seats. And, uh, and it's, it's, but they're, they're paired off or they're, they're triplets, in, as, as the case may be. Um, so yeah, so if, if you want to talk about the, the differences um, between the candidates, let's, um, I guess we'll start in the South. Well, it yeah. just it, on the districts first, before you go into that, yeah. the Pasha Majdi thing with the districts may be confusing because he okay. was appointed to finish the seat out of one district, but is right. running out of a different one. Right. Um, you know, little, little musical chairs going on there. Um, and that's also re one of the reasons why we only have four commissioners right now, because um, when, once the appeal was, was finalized, one of the commissioners was ineligible to continue serving because he was, you know, uh, hadn't qualified at, at the right time. So that it gets into this arcana of, uh, can I use that word on the, sure. on the radio? Hey, absolutely. Uh, of election law. It's of, the first time it's been used on the radio, <laughs> I think. Um, I mean, literally, the, you know, the, the, the gentleman from the Secretary of State State's office has been calling in like every other month, you know, and the commission's been, well, what do we do in this case? Because it, it's not been contemplated. And that shows you there's a, just a terrible amount of confusion in right. Jefferson County because we've gone through uh, maybe 12 different commissioners in the last uh, two years. And the Mountain Party candidate was removed by the Secretary of State's office, correct? Um, well, it wasn't removed. So, it, it, again, just to go down to that 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 rabbit hole, uh, Jennifer Krause, who had been elected as a Republican uh, a few days before she was removed, she switched her party registration to Mountain Party. So any person who filled that seat had to be from the Mountain Party. Excuse me, Steve. You know the reason she did that? That's very quite unusual. I, uh, I've not been uh, spoken yeah. with her uh, okay. since then. Uh, but it certainly threw a monkey wrench into the, um, yeah. the, the smooth you know, sort of filling of this. Because the Mountain Party is so small, and this is the, the chairman of the party was on the phone with the county commission a, a couple of meetings ago explaining that um, there's only 200, there's less than, uh, fewer than 200 uh, registered Mountain Party people in the county. So they were having trouble coming up with three names. He, he said the equivalent would be for the Republicans to nominate 300 people yeah. out of their base yeah. to, to fill the seat. Um, so, the, you know, the, the, the Secretary of State uh, didn't really have anything to remove. It was just that... Um, the person who had been filling that seat hadn't been with the Mountain Party by a certain deadline. So they, according to state law, they had they had to have been registered prior to 90 days prior to May 1, and they they were not. So it was really more they just didn't qualify. So it wasn't wasn't anything that anybody else actively right, did. Right. Yeah. I recall that he has not, and we actually talked to him about that. When we interviewed. I can't remember right. his name right now. No, oh, he actually turned out to be a very. I mean, he was a very energetic uh, and thoughtful commissioner for the forty-five days or so. Yes. Yeah. Uh, but he wasn't a Mountain Party member for life. He had just switched because he thought that would be the easiest way to get on the commission. Well, uh, did you say that? I didn't. Uh, I think that was pretty much the gist of the interview. He, okay. He left us with the impression that he would, if he were to run, it would be as a Republican. Yeah, that's what I, um, I understood. But um, yeah. but he's not running. Um, so anyway, we'll, we'll talk about, you know, that's kind of, uh, we got a lot of history in Jefferson County. Uh, as, as, as If you scratch the surface, people like to talk about the history. But yeah. a, a lot of the questions in the county commission race are about the future. You know, that's really, you know, the, the county, as, as you guys over here in Berkeley are, are want to say, we're just a sleepy, you know, you know, country little county, you know, hanging off to the east of uh, this cosmopolitan uh, Berkeley County. Over that, was prior here. To say the, that. that was prior to the Rockwell protests <laughs> that, changed, that changed everything. Yeah. But, uh, you know, but really, you know, Jefferson County hadn't grown. I mean, it had been pretty stable for, you know, 10 or 15 years uh, prior to a couple of years ago. And then, you know, the housing started to pick back up, housing growth. But not for the school-aged children. That has gone down. Well, it, it has, but it, it, talk about that for a minute. Okay. So, um, you know, the thing about families and, and children it, it's kind of like birds and their, and their nest, right? So you, you have a, a younger couple, they, they get married, they're living in an apartment. You know, they're thinking, well, where are we going to live? They, you know, they, they, they buy their first townhouse or, you know, start their home. And then so the nature takes its course 
but it takes, you know, for school aged children to show up, it kind of takes five to six years. Mm -hmm. you, you don't see them right away. So we're not seeing a lot of people moving to Jefferson County with families. So it's not like what, you know, like, like Fairfax and, and Loudoun was mm -hmm. seeing when they were doing their booms. I mean, people were, were just moving out, you know, to get bigger houses. Here, these are, uh, a, a lot of the housing that's being built, as you can see, it, it's smaller uh, townhomes because it's affordable mm -hmm. uh, to people moving out. But they're, they're moving out as couples. Uh, but you are starting to see very small kids. And when I say kids, I mean like in strollers. So I think, you know, when you, when you look into the future, you can see that this, this trend line of declining school population will, will flatten out, but it will take a few years. Um, you know, it's like that, that wave when you're looking at the ocean. You know, it's flat, it's flat, it's flat, and all of a sudden then you're sitting, you know, on your butt because you turned around and there came the wave. Like you it knocked it. you down. Right. You Which know? makes you wonder if closing North Jefferson is a wise decision. Well, that came up in the conversation um, because, you know, the, the citizens in the audience were doing the math and they weren't buying it, what the school system was putting out. That, uh, you know, just looking at, you know, Ranson Elementary is scheduled to open next year. Uh, I think it's like 500 seats. The current school has under 300. But when you look at the number of new homes already being built in Ranson, it's you know, a couple thousand. And if they figure that, well, there's a half child per house, you know, that's a lot of children. And so the, the audience was thinking, well, by the time you get Ranson open, and in a few years it'll be full, and then you've already closed this, so then what are you we're gonna be building another school? Or are we gonna be putting trailers, you know, on the parking lot that we have next to Ranson? Mm -hmm. um, so the, the school board did defer that decision. I think they, uh, they're, they're going through a process, and it is, again, a state-mandated process because we're a Dillon rule state, which means the state tells us everything we can do or not do. So, and the same thing with the schools. They're, they're sort of governed a lot by state regulations, so they do have to go through this. If they ask the question, they've got to do these public hearings and get the data. Um, but they have deferred doing any decision on it because they want to do they want to collect some more data and they want to understand what the population trends. I think that's the struggle because uh, again it was so flat and we're seeing this in a lot of different issues across the county is that when you've, you've gotten used to things being the same and all of a sudden the curve of, of growth has it's almost exponential. I mean it has literally almost doubled every year since the last four years. I mean we were doing under 200 houses per year and we're on track now to be doing over 1,200 in 2024, minimum. Yeah. You know, that's what we can see. Steve, you mentioned that uh, most of the commissioners are looking forward as opposed to looking backward. Uh, and you're out talking to a lot of the residents. Uh, what are the major issues that folks are looking for in this race? Is growth one? Well, that's what I'm saying is, is, is I don't know that um, – I don't know that the commissioners are all looking forward, uh, you know, and, and when I say the commissioners and, you know, like the sitting commissioners and the prior commissioners, that may have been part of the problem. But, yeah, no, it is all tied to growth. I mean, it is, you know, when you talk about the ambulance services, it's tied to growth. You know, how you take a, a limited number of, you know, a ambulance, you know, and equipment and spread it around to cover this population, you know, what schools you're going to be building, uh, how much you're funding parks and recs. I mean, you know, soccer fields are a big mm -hmm. thing. Um, you know, where the retail is, is, is going to be, where the traffic is going to go. Um, and the solar ties into it because uh, you mentioned, you know, Rockwell. Um, the growth has all been uh, residential. And, you know, that, that's one of the things that Jefferson has struggled with. I mean, over here in Berkeley, I mean, you've got the – I-81, you've got the transportation, you've got, you know, a, a history of manufacturing, you know, it's changed over the years. I mean, you don't think you have any, any more of the, 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 the clothing mills, but you've got, you know, P&G, you've got Clorox, you've got a lot of distribution facilities. You know, in, in Jefferson, it, it struggled with that. And you and I have talked about this uh, a, a lot. Um, and a lot of the commit, you know, the, the uh, candidates running, you know, want to have, we, we need a, a tax base, we need a commercial tax base, but that is, slow going. I mean, there's counties around the country that are, have been trying to get a commercial tax base for, for decades. And it, it, right now, all we're seeing is, is housing. And so that's concerning on a couple of levels, uh, because a lot of the draw for people, you know, moving in is, you know, is lower taxes. But if all you have are houses, at some point, you know, th those are going to have to carry all the freight. 
Um, and we're seeing this, you know, there's a, one of the issues that's going to be front and center uh, as the uh, new commissioners you know, come in will be um, impact fees. I mean, it's on the table right now, so they may vote, vote on it before the election, but they've got to have public hearings, um, so they can't. Uh, so Now, Steve, uh, Jefferson County has, has had impact fees for several years. What has changed now? Yeah. Well, if, if, if you go back, you know, down memory lane, um, when, when they adopted them, you know, a consultant, you hire a consultant, they tell you, well, this is what it's going to be costing for each new increment of service, whether it's, uh, you know, uh, manpower in the uh, sheriff's office, whether it's uh, square feet or, or acreage, you know, for parks, um, whether it's, you know, classroom space per, per student. Because the law requires that your impact fees be equitable. You can't just say, well, we're going to charge the new people for everything. So it has to be for infrastructure. It can't be for operating costs. And it has to be proportionate, uh, meaning that if I come in, you know, and I'm going to take up in your house, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, like, I'm to take up one more bed and I'm going to eat, you know, two more sandwiches, you know, well, then I'm going to, I, I can charge you an impact fee for that extra bed and the extra space in the refrigerator to store, you know, my peanut butter jar and, and whatnot, but I can't charge you for all the slices of bread and I can't charge you for the whole refrigerator. So it's, it's a very, you know, fine-tuned calculation. And they were set somewhat low initially, you know, and then uh, about two, two years ago, three years ago, um, looking back at the school growth, uh, the county commission decided, well, we don't need to collect impact fees for schools because we don't need to, you know, build any more schools so they slashed it down to one dollar and they didn't uh, really fully fund uh, uh, ambulance services because at the time the county didn't have ambulance service they, you know, it was operated by the volunteers so they weren't collecting impact fees for ambulances um, the parks and rec was um, and they were collecting for so sheriff so Steve hang on yeah. a second because we have to do a hard break here Sorry. And you're, you're good uh, we'll be right back with more with Steve Pearson as we look into the upcoming election from the Jefferson County angle. And our guest, Steve Pearson from the West Virginia Independent Observer. Good morning. It's good to have you here with us, Steve. Steve will join us on the 15th for our first of two candidate forums that we are doing at the Berkeley County Commission Chamber Meeting Room on the second floor of the building there. And those will be uh, welcome, uh, open to the public. If you can't make it in person, you can join us on TV 10 on uh, the radio here on AM 740 and FM 1065, and of course with our usual Facebook stream that we do live each day in studio, and we'll be doing from the candidate form as well. Uh, Steve, a quick summary of the uh, county commission race, then we'll move on to the House of Delegates and then the Rucker-Doyle race uh, as well, too. So as you see those races stacking up, how do you view them with the four that are up for, uh, for election? Well, one of the things I, I, I would uh, point out, and... This is, uh, you know, I, I know the Admiral will appreciate this, is by and large, the candidates have been very civil to each other. Right. Yeah. And really, what, what does come out uh, when you talk to them and when they're debating is they all have an abiding passion for making Jefferson County a, a better place. Um, so it really has been focusing on local issues, which is a little re refreshing because, uh, you know, two years ago we, uh, we did not have that uh, in, in, at the county commission level. We were dragging national politics with all the, uh, the drama that that entails into it. And this is very much a, uh, a, a potholes and potatoes uh, kind, of, uh, kind of race we have going on. So in the, um, the, you know, the first race that everyone knew was on the radar was, was – the, the person for the middleweight district. And again, all residents will vote for all these candidates. It's just that they, we try to keep it fair by making sure that there's at least people live all around the county and not everyone's coming living in Charlestown. They're not all city folks. They're mm -hmm. not all farmers. So you have Natalie Grantham Friend and uh, Mike Mood. And Mike Mood's a, a small businessman. Uh, runs the, He's the chief of the uh, middleway uh, uh, fire department. And I think that's why he got into... Uh, the politics uh, on the commission because he was so involved with the EMS uh, transfer and he was a little bit, uh, you know, as a lot of folks were unhappy with the, the lack of transparency and, and, and the way the county commission uh, did that. So uh, that was his draw to, to get into it. Uh, Natalie, uh, her family has been uh, farming in uh, Jefferson County since 
before it was Jefferson County, since before it was Berkeley County, since before it was Orange County, since uh, before it was Frederick County, it's some, somewhere around 1730-something. Pretty amazing, huh? Yeah. Um, you know, I, I forget how many generations uh, of, of farmers, uh, but that they've been there since um, the first settlers. And, um, you know, it's pretty, it's pretty amazing when you think about it. I mean, yeah. you think about like how long... A, you know, a, a, a local business operates and uh, to have something that's coming up on almost 300 years of, of operation, you know. Oh, yeah. And, but it, and so that requires a lot of shifting uh, and, and uh, innovation. And you can't keep doing the same thing over and over. And her father, you know, uh, made a lot of changes in, in the operation. And she's, you know, keeps, keeps it going. But, you know, she's also a, an electrician. And um, so these are, two, you know, two people that have really – you know, invested in in the community, and, and they know each other, um, and and that's that's apparent when they're when they're racing. So I think, you know, they are um, they have different uh, you know specific ideas, but um, both of those are are strong candidates, and they're they're really going out. What what do you see as the most competitive race in for the county commission? Um, that's a good question. I hadn't really thought about that because I think actually. Um, they're, they're all competitive. You think they'll all be close? Yeah, I, I, I think they will. Okay. Yeah. Let's uh, because I think there's a lot of, you know, a lot of times because the county commission is all the way down at the end of the ballot, you know, typically. Mm -hmm. um, but I think there's been so much activation on the local population when, when we first uh, started covering like the planning commission meetings, and I was going to the things about the solar. There'd be maybe one or two people there, and same thing with the comprehensive plan, and about I think about. about Four to six months ago, they had a meeting. They had over two hundred people show up. And, and unusual, huh? I, well, it, the, the the poor folks at the planning commission were sitting up there and saying, "You could see it in their faces." Yeah. And then at the next planning commission meeting, uh, they voted to take something off that at the table that had been proposed because these citizens showed up. So I think the citizens have have now understood, you know, how to get these people to pay attention, and and they are showing up. Yeah. So. Quick question. One yeah. last question yeah. on county commission. Will Steve Starlipper have long coattails or short coattails in this election? Well, you know, since you opened that, that door, I think, you know, as you said, there's five seats on the county commission, four of them on the ballot. The one that's actually not on the ballot, I think, is the one that, that a lot of people are thinking about as they vote. Because you know he's been, Steve Stolzer has been the president of the county commission. You know, he's going into his uh, this is his second year, a full year of being uh, president of the county commission. Um, and he was on the planning commission, you know, prior to that. Um, and he's also was the re uh, chairman of the local Republican executive committee. So it's come up as an issue. It's like, well, okay, so who, what's going to be the majority? You know, as and is it going to be people who are uh, aligned with you know? the prior sort of uh, setup of the, of the county commission, or is it going to be people who are, who are new or are going to be, you know, more of a, you know, different viewpoints mm -hmm. and, and different voices. That's one of the questions that I've been asking some of the candidates is, are you sympathetic to the Jackson Krause wing of the Republican party? Well, obviously Krause mountain party now, but right. Uh, or are you more along the lines of a Pasha Majdi who came in, not necessarily sympathetic to them, but with uh, prying eyes as to why are we so messed up both financially and relationship wise here. So it's been interesting to hear some of those answers. The three way race, the Charlestown district, uh, David Tab, there aren't a lot of Mountain Party registered voters. Does he affect that race? He does, because if you go back and look, he's he, he's pulled in a fair uh, number of votes in the past couple of times he's run. And when you think of uh, you know the, the Mountain Party's official platform, uh, I I don't think you know where Mr. Tab and uh, Mr. Lutz, who are the local uh, candidates, because Lutz is the was the conservation yes. uh, person. Um, they approach it from a personal liberty and conservation perspective, but not some of the other social issues that the Mountain Party you know supports. So. Um, there's been a little bit of uh, conflict between the state party and you know the local you know uh, people running on the ticket, which you know, you're you're free to do. I mean, anybody could walk in and register as a Republican um, and say, well, um, 
I'm for, uh, you know, legalized, you know, uh, marijuana and, you know, legalized prostitution, but I'm running as a Republican. Now, the primaries tend to weed candidates like that out, but the Mountain no Party No pun didn't. intended there with the legalized marijuana. There you go. <laughs> I, I'm glad I used that one in some, in, in, instead of the other example. Yeah. Um, but so the Mountain Party was a, there was no, there was no primary. So it was more of a self-nomination. Yeah. So it was kind of like what you said, you know, uh, Commissioner Cook. I mean, it was a, it's a door to get onto the ballot. Um, but again, so, you know, David Tabb has a very um, committed, you know, base of supporters here. So being a three-way race, um, I'd say Jack Kefiste is more of the, uh, I, don't, what, 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 I don't even know how to describe it, more the right wing of yes. the Republican Party, not, yeah. not, not, not the sort of centrist. More, or, and he's more sympathetic to the Jackson and uh, Krauss I would, say, I, would, I would say so. I mean, if you, you, you've had him on the show. Yeah, yeah. He, said he said so, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then you have uh, James Walsh, who is a younger guy. Uh, you know, he's, he's lived here his whole life, um, which is more of a centrist, you know, Democrat. So, yeah, you have this interesting dynamic that it isn't like a traditional Republican versus a traditional Democrat or a, you know, a right-wing Republican versus a, a liberal Democrat. They're all kind of clustered around the center we have about 10 minutes left i want yeah. to get into the role money well, might time moves fast it does right? the role money might play in the house of delegates race yeah so um you know you have uh a couple races you have you have one uh, wayne clark and, and bill uh, ridenauer are the two sitting uh, delegates mm -hmm. uh you know wayne has been two terms already or is this mm -hmm. this will be his third that he's running for I believe. I think he might be on his third. Third, yeah. yeah. Running on his third, I think. Yeah. Um, and he has, um, you know, he's, uh, we, remember we were at the forum mm -hmm. and, and I asked him a question about, uh, you know, child care. Yes. Um, and he really didn't have a, a strong answer. And I did, he came back and he's done, obviously done a lot of research because it, the, the question came up and, and another question and he actually participated in a forum that, that the Stubblefield Institute, uh, a panel about child care. And uh, had obviously done his homework, you know, and, and reframed it as a um, an economic development issue. Uh, so I was very impressed. But so, you know, you have someone like that who's got uh, a, a track record, and he's attracted a, a good amount of money. Um, and he's being challenged by Osmond Anderson. Um, you know, Wayne went through a primary, beat uh, a, a, an opponent who was more of the for lack of a better term, we'll call it the Jackson Krause mm -hmm. ring. It sounds like a sounds like you should have a dinner about that, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and um, so Wayne's raised almost fifty thousand um, dollars, you know, and his his uh, challenger, you know, Mr. Anderson has has not raised anywhere near that uh, amount. So it's it's a big challenge when you have someone who's uh, you know already in in, in as, as a delegate. Com Compare that to uh, on on uh, District 100, which is you know the the mountain and sort of curves around the river into uh, you know Shepherdstown. That's the Ridenauer district. It's the Ridenauer district. Um, he hasn't raised very much money um, at all. Uh, the challenger uh, Maria Russo, the Democrat, uh, also did not have a. Well, neither of them had a primary challenge. Neither Ridenauer or, or Russo. Um, but she has really played up her hometown roots. You know, born here, raised here went away to school and came back here. And that's been one of the, the central um, uh, issues that she's been raising is how do we make it so that my peers can come back here or, or not have to leave? I mean, you know, she, you know, how do we make sure that the Eastern Panhandle is a place where people can stay and raise their families? You know, and uh, I want to live here. And so she's raised over you know $50,000, so uh, almost uh, you know six, seven times what uh, what, what right now. Are those running. primary local small donations, Steve, or does your big money come from somewhere else? Eighty-four percent within the state of Virginia, West Virginia. West Virginia. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And and then uh, as you also look at the Lucia Valentine race, this is the open Espinosa seat there with Chris Anders. This is a fascinating race too. Yeah. Yeah. Um, What's the money look like there? Well, I would say that it's about a three-to-one advantage with uh, with uh, Miss Valentine. That's interesting because you're telling me that two Democrats have outraised two Republicans, and we are told that it's difficult for Democrats to raise money in this state. But both of them, both uh, uh, Lucia Valentine, has has focused on the same issues. Again, s similar in age to uh, Maria Russo, uh, young young woman uh, who works here in the state, grew up here, uh, decided to stay here. 
uh, her husband, uh, is, you know, is, they're, they're starting a family, or you know, I presume wanted to start a family. They want to stay here. And that's, I think that is what's resonating with, with people. As they look around and you see the, the cost of, of living going up, the cost of housing growing up, and, <clears throat> and we're kind of at a crossroads. I, I assume you're, you know, it's the same thing over here in Berkeley. Um, how do you find a place to rent? You know, how do you find a, a job that pays enough to, to buy a house? Um, or are you forced to move somewhere else, you mm -hmm. know, to, to Pennsylvania at this point? Because you can't afford Frederick, you know, certainly. Um, so yeah, I, I think it. And it, again, uh, Lucia's uh, money is eighty-six percent come from West Virginia. Um, her, 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 Chris Anders, the Republican, sixty percent, almost seventy percent of his money's come from out of state. So it, it's a very different d donor base, you know, uh, and supporter base. Now, uh, uh, out of state through PACs or through individual donations? Combination of both. Yeah. You know, a lot of a lot of individuals because you know, uh, Chris, Chris was a professional political operative, mm -hmm. so presumably he's made a lot of contacts, and you know that seems to where you know it's, it's people he worked with in, in sort of these national issues. So, political ops, baby. Yeah, yeah, but not again. So a rel a somewhat newcomer. So again, you've got these um, two two young people, young women who you know grew up here, and they're running against uh, older, you know, somewhat older men who are you know. Coming, you know, moved in, moved in, um, you know, and and a hometown person is is that that seems to be resonating with, with voters too. You see a little bit of that in the in the Shepherdstown race. You, know, you get Carrie Blessing. You know, she's again, she's a grew up here, and same thing. She she went away, got a, a, a college degree, got a, a master's degree. Um, I'm trying to remember, I can't remember what it was in, but um, come back here. She's she's raised, she's got a, a family here. Uh, her husband works here. Um, they wanted to stay here, mm -hmm. and they wanted they would like their peers to be able to stay here and and, and raise families here too. Steve, uh, both uh, Bill Reidenhauer, uh, Reidenhauer and uh, Chris Andrews are viewed as more to the right, uh, hard right. Is that going to come into play in either one of these elections? Well, I assume it would. I mean, it, it and it, but it, it it depends on what part of the the electorate you know turns out. Um, and again, I think. We talked about the, can the, the county commission, where it was very much of a local race. What I see is candidates like Maria Russo running in the 100th and Lucia Valentine running in the 97th. They are very, very focused on local eastern panhandle issues, you know, f you know f f raising families, economic uh, you know, development. And when you look at the issues that are that, you know, right now are, the right now are, are highlighting or Chris Anders are highlighting, they tend to be more national issues. They tend to be more philosophical issues. Culture issues. Culture hot button issues. Um, and so I think that'll be an interesting, you know, dynamic to see how that plays out, whether, you know, the, the broader electorate is mm -hmm. really interested in what, what, what our future looks like here, you know, because a lot of things you hear is like, we don't want here to look like everywhere else. Right. Yeah. Five minutes left. Let's get into Rucker Doyle. They, uh, by the way, hosted their first debate uh, last week i guess it was and did not use a for uh, a uh, moderator and they uh, i believe they both said it went very well well they did and you know i i remember i was i was there they went they had their announcement at the courthouse and um i asked them both i said well you're going to sell tickets you know to the, you know, ask for reservations and and uh, john doyle looked at me and laughed and said <laughs> you know we're not worried about it we, you know we'll have plenty of room you know uh, you know they had a full house mm-hmm and um, now part of that may be because there was no moderator. So maybe people were thinking, okay, this is going to be like a NASCAR race with no speed limits. <laughs> um, but <laughs> Good way to put it. Yeah. But again, got to give credit to the Admiral here. This was co-sponsored by the, the Bo Bill and Bonnie Stubblefield Institute for Civil Political Discourse. Did yeah, I get that right? Yeah, that's right. That, that is not a phrase for radio. I think you've just used that. Civility is a better word. Civility. <laughs> um, and they... You know, both uh, uh, John Doyle and Patricia Rucker have been around, you know, in, in, in the State House, and they've worked, you know, uh, there. And they're very much focused on what they can do for the Eastern Panhandle. And but, but there's nothing, a commonality yeah. there. And, yeah. and both of them, they have been around quite a while, and there was could be through time to adopt this going to win at all costs. 
and regardless of what I need to do, I'm going to win. They've taken just the opposite tack. Mm -hmm. They have uh, they've uh, kind of discarded their their personal biasness, and they have general affection for each other. Also, they're devoting or they're directing toward the issues. Yes, I think they're both to be commended for this. And that's what I was going to say is that they really have decided. Well, you know, let's just let the chips lie where they may mm -hmm. fall, but let's help illuminate where we stand. You know, without being vindictive yeah. or attacked, you know, they agree to disagree. And you know, I think that's one of the things we see in, in the legislative process is that you know, if it's not a win at all costs, you know, there are lots of different ways to move the ball forward. Mm -hmm. and, and we can collectively move it you know, yeah. forward. And maybe sometimes it's on my side of the field. Maybe sometimes it's on your side of the field. But we don't kick the ball out of the stadium you know, and then go tear up the turf just because we don't and, like it. Yeah. <laughs> and as far as uh, philosophy, political philosophy, two candidates could not be farther apart than these two are. This is true. Yeah. Yeah. Well, but they do have the, the one thing in common. They're both survivors. I mean, John Doyle is a, is a self-professed liberal in West Virginia at a time when it couldn't be less popular to be a liberal in West Virginia. And Patricia Rucker survived the Republican primary where the Senate president, who she tried to unseat, endorsed Delegate Paula Espinosa to replace her in the Senate. And, and what happened to the Senate president? He was defeated, as was Mr. Espinosa, and Patricia Rucker is still standing. Interesting dynamic there. Right? That's what I say. They're, they're both yeah. survivors. And, yeah. and neither one has been apologetic about their views. They've, they've, uh, here's what I am. This is what I believe what I in. Here's what I am. Exactly right. No apologies. And, you know, I think when you, in the case of uh, Patricia Rucker, I mean, she, she has a very committed base of supporters, you know, in, in Jefferson County because she's been there and, you know, reached out and, and, and speaks to people. You know, mm -hmm. she doesn't try to – it's not an air campaign. It's a ground campaign. Yeah. I've always found when we've had Patricia on the program, mm -hmm. Senator Rucker, that she's always been available uh, for interviews on the show. Uh, she's always well informed, and she always, uh, I think, does a good job of explaining her position on an issue as to why she voted a certain way, and I respect that. Yeah, and I think that's one of the things that you know, from the Eastern Panhandle perspective, because we're an awful far, you know, long way away from Charleston, and the more that we can have candidates that are pulling together, you know, representing our region, because you know, when you look at what, what's going on here, you know, in terms of growth and expansion, they don't have that in, in, in most of the state. And they don't even understand that. You know, the, the, when, we, the, when our folks at county commission say, we need more roads, you know, like, well, why do you need roads? You right. know, aren't your roads good enough? And uh, the, 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 the traffic, I mean, I think if you were, you know, and I've, I've heard this, you know, it's like when, when delegates from, you know, the, the southwestern part of the state come up here, they, they, they just can't fathom how dense this is. And, and we consider this bucolic. Put them all on Route 9, man. Yeah. Yep, take them through Hedgesville at any hour of the day and then tell me we don't need Route 9 fixed around here. Yeah. Uh, Steve, we're just about out of time. Here we look forward to seeing you again on the 15th. We appreciate you coming in today. Yeah, we'll put some candidates on the hot seat maybe. It'll be fun. <laughs> all right. Yeah, I think they enjoy that sort of thing. Right. And the next uh, Rucker-Doyle debate is on the 15th. Yes. So they'll be uh, on our 22nd date forum, by the way. Back with the final minute. Steve, stay right where you are.